today. Tell us about Mount St. Helens and what you want us to learn. Well, uh, I, just to call attention to this uh, nine-hour eruption on May 18, 1980, it released uh, 440 million tons of TNT blast energy, wow. 33,000 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs. 33,000 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs. And it, it was a colossal explosion. And uh, atomic bomb a second, essentially. So that's the, uh, that's the power output of this volcano. And uh, the scripture, Psalm 46, verse 8, Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he has made in the earth. And I take that literally, right? Yes, sir. Uh, so I go out there to see those desolations. And, of course, we remember what the mountain looked like before. It was a very beautiful mountain. Pristine, it, beautiful. Yeah, uh, forest, lake, everything. And then uh, it lost 1,300 feet of summit elevation on the morning of May 18. Wow. This gigantic landslide, half a cubic mile of summit slid away into the lake and into the river basin next to it. And then behind it, the big steam explosion. And it was just extraordinary. This is the before image, before the eruption. And uh, you can see uh, this area. I've got the next photograph from exactly the same position after the eruption. But I'll call your attention to this. You want to look at that. You want to look at that right here. And uh, you might want to look at this ridge right here. OK, now, here it is after. Watch those points carefully. <laughs> They're gone. Yeah, look at look, the top of the mountain completely changed. Wow. And uh, it lost 1,300 feet of summit elevation. It's hard to believe it's the same mountain. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, it was incredible geologic change. It was Disneyland for a catastrophic geologist like me to go see what the geologic change was there at the mountain. Here is a simulation of the first 50 seconds of the eruption. As the earthquake shook the mountain, 5.1 magnitude earthquake, the whole north slope began to slide in a gigantic debris avalanche. This debris avalanche moving at freeway speed off the mountain, uh, dispersed rock fragments, released the pressure inside the volcano, super hot liquid water in the magma in the chamber flashed the steam. And a supersonic steam jet propelled itself over the debris avalanche deposit so down there next to the lake, the, the steam blast actually got there first and knocked down and toasted the forest. That's the simulation of what we think happened during the first 50 seconds of the eruption. The southwest corner of Spirit Lake, right in here, is the site of up to 600 feet of deposits. Up to 600 feet of deposits have formed there since 1980. There's a new landslide debris dam for the lake. The lake is in a different, occupying a different position in space, higher than uh, it was sky before the eruption. It's in that's now sky, and the, this whole landscape, uh, something like 62 square kilometer area of, of debris avalanche deposit, has sat there over the last 30 years. We've been able to study what's been going on there. It's Earth's newest landscape, and uh, uh, rapid deposition occurred there. Here you see one of these uh, pyroclastic flows, a glowing avalanche of uh, particles, a dense avalanche falling off of the, ma the mountain. These pyroclastic flows are amazing, and uh, they uh, call our attention to the swift process. When the pyroclastic flows stop, they freeze rapidly, and they form these very interesting deposits. In cross-section, you can see what a pyroclastic flow deposit looks like. Right here is 25 feet in thickness, a pyroclastic flow. That pyroclastic flow is right there, 25 feet in thickness. That formed on June 12, 1980, by a, a three-hour eruption, where glowing avalanche of particles came off the summit. And uh, it deposited a layered or laminated deposit. It was uh, very interesting. Here you see the nine-hour eruption on May 18. You see the June 12th deposit, and then you see the March 19th, 1982 mud flow deposit. Each layer at Mount St. Helens has a date. And uh, that, uh, that's amazing. And so as I started looking at the June 12th, 1980, three-hour eruption deposit from uh, late in the evening on, May, uh, on June 12th, I started uh, seeing that lamination. Here's the top of it. 
See the layered appearance? I had thought that the catastrophe would homogenize the coarse and the fine. And this avalanche of particles actually separated it, the coarse and the fine into layers. And uh, so that was, uh, that was shocking to me because I, I thought that something moving so fast like that would homogenize the layers and mix them all together, not separate them out. And the closer you get to the June 12th deposit, the more layered it becomes. There's, there's just a, a foot or so of the upper part. And even lamination right in here formed, believe it or not, in a hurricane. Okay, that, that is uh, unbelievable. So the particle separation rapidly challenges our, our, my way of thinking about stratification elsewhere. You know, in the Grand Canyon, the Tapeat sandstone is 350 feet thick. And uh, that has, uh, it's a sandstone, and it has layering like you see at the pyroclastic flows at Mount St. Helens. And so I started thinking about the sedimentary evidence of rapid accumulation of sandstones in the Grand Canyon. We've been accustomed to thinking in terms of maybe 50 million years to deposit uh, hundreds of feet of sandstone. Yet at Mount St. Helens, we've seen the actual process that can form the, the layerings and the stratification rapidly. In one day? Essentially in a day. Uh, three hours there, we saw 25 feet 25 of strata feet three that hours. formed. Yeah. Uh, so the, these processes go on, and we need to understand them and their application to other strata layers, like in Grand Canyon. So I find myself believing that a global catastrophic flood can form sedimentary layers like in Grand Canyon on the basis of seeing the, 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 the laboratory uh, experiment that God gave us at Mount St. Helens. Okay, now there's a large amount of erosion that occurred, to the, especially to the debris avalanche deposit after the eruption in 1980. And these erosion features formed rapidly. Like they were jetting steam from buried ice and water at a depth underneath the hot volcanic ash Within days, steam was jetting to the surface. There's the lake, Mount St. Helens Spirit Lake, covered with logs. And then it came back, and look at this. The steaming had stopped a month later, and uh, we see around the big steam explosion pit this rill and gully topography. The rill and gully topography is amazing because uh, that formed within five days by gravity collapsing the lip of the pit as this steam eruption was occurring. Yet it reminds me of the badlands of South Dakota or some of the deserts of the southwest United States. And if this could form quickly, that did too. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I, I find myself saying, what is there that, uh, that can't form rapidly? Like, for example, here's an ancient lava flow from probably about 500 years ago that was gouged out after the summer of 1980 by a mud flow that came through here. This is on the north flank of Mount St. Helens. Solid rock was gouged out by a mud flow. And today we see the small stream and the waterfall going through the canyon. So uh, can rapid canyon formation related to um, catastrophic process like mud flows. This is a deep canyon over 100 feet deep, eroded through solid rock, ancient lava flow, ancient volcanic landslide deposit, ancient volcanic ash layer. All that was gouged out after the summer of 1980. So erosion is uh, prominent right in front of us. And hard rock erosion uh, making uh, extremely uh, large cliffs and deep canyons. Okay, March 19, 1982, there was, behind the lava dome at Mount St. Helens, back in there, a lot of snow. And that snow melted when... Uh, the summit eruption occurred. It wasn't a big eruption, but it melted the snow rather rapidly and created what? A big mud flow came down. And a lot of water from the 15 feet or so of melted snow in there all of a sudden came down and it mixed with volcanic ash and formed the mud flows. Most of the mud flow went down the north fork of the Toodle River this way. Also, some of the mud went uh, into Spirit Lake. And that mud flow of March 19, 1982, was big enough to overtop the debris avalanche deposit and cut a canyon through it. And so I've been uh, very interested in studying the area right in here, this area where the uh, big breach occurred, where mud 
uh, spilled into a pit, overtopped a, a dam, and then drained through a spillway, back cut a, a canyon, what I call Little Grand Canyon. Here you can see the area where the mud flow came. The mud flow came down out of the crater, right through this area right here, ponded right in this area, then it overtopped came down this uh, spillway and went down to the, uh, the ocean. This giant mud flow had enough power to overtop that barrier, and as it overtopped the barrier, it cut back through and made, right in that little area there, a little Grand Canyon. So uh, huh. saw this uh, canyon as I ventured in that area, saw this canyon, and uh, it was amazing. Okay, uh, I can see uh, many of the same features as the real Grand Canyon. The uh, cup-shaped side canyons right here, uh, the gully-headed side canyons that extend up into it. And then notice we have a flat plain north and south, okay, like the real Grand Canyon. And then the breach has a kind of a turning path as it goes through. And uh, so the snaky path reminds me of Grand Canyon uh, oh, sure. terrain. Sure. And so in 1983, in August, I was overlooked this, I thought, oh, this is a Little Grand Canyon sitting here. I started calling it Little Grand Canyon. Now it's in the peer-reviewed geologic literature, Little Grand Canyon. And so uh, the Grand Canyon is a, um, uh, something to think about as you, you stand here and ponder that terrain. Look at the, uh, the freestanding cliffs and the, and the small stream. The right canyon over here, I'll show you in the next image, here it is. 140-foot cliff, small stream flowing through that canyon. Do you think that small stream eroded that big, wide canyon <laughs> one sand grain at a time? I don't think so. Okay. Uh, it might appear that way, but we have the eyewitness reports. And uh, it, this, this was formed by, by catastrophic drainage over a period of months as drainage occurred through there, and uh, it created this canyon. There is a man right there for scale on top of that cliff, okay, and there's a small stream, okay, and, and you think about that is, that, uh, uh, is that millions of years of erosion or a rapid uh, event? And of course, uh, we all uh, need to appreciate what rapid erosion can do at Mount St. Helens. And it reminds me of the Grand Canyon. The evidence of a lake was off to the east of Grand Canyon. That lake may have overtopped the dam in northern North Central Arizona here, the Kaibab Upwarp, and as the, the lake drained through, it could breach a spillway, just like at Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens is a breach dam formed by mud. Grand Canyon could be a breach dam formed by catastrophic drainage of a huge lake. It, it just seems to me that if you look at catastrophe as the reason for one, which we know because, I mean, it's verifiable, then you have to think cat catastrophe when you look at the Grand Canyon. You Absolutely do. have to. Yeah. And almost all geologists now are of the opinion that the Colorado River did not cut Grand Canyon. And we're asking what did really make Grand Canyon now? And we're going to some way out thinking, like thinking about Mount St. Helens, catastrophic drainage of mud breaking the dam. Well, sure. I've been involved with, with uh, looking at the logs and log deposits of Spirit Lake. And uh, I was out at Spirit Lake. Uh, sitting down there next to the lake eating my lunch, and I saw these three sticks that floated in. Notice the top of the sticks is, stick, is floating out of the water. And these, these guys are sitting there standing upright. And it reminded me of the logs. Could the logs also float upright in the, uh, the lake? And a uh, million logs were floating in the lake. Could they also go into upright position? They could sink to the bottom and become upright uh, standing logs, I thought to myself. Then they could get buried with the root ends at different levels. I had a hypothesis by looking at those floating sticks that, that gave me an idea that I needed to check out about the bottom of Spirit Lake. Could the logs float in vertical position, sink to the bottom, and get buried in standing position at the bottom of the lake? If they could, that would be a radical rethought thinking of the ordinary way of how wood gets petrified in the earth. Because how do we think of upright standing logs in strata layers? We think, oh, there was a soil and a forest that grew there and was later buried. And so uh, this idea was a very outrageous idea, uh, contrary to the idea how, about how forests might be buried. These are re-embedded uh, or replanted forests, 
okay, in the bottom of the lake. Take a look at the, the log mat on Spirit Lake. Millions of logs were floating on Spirit Lake the day after the eruption, and then these, these vertical logs start appearing, and inclined logs start getting deposited. And if you look at the log mat itself, there's evidence of upright floaters in the log mat and off to the edge. These upright logs can float with the root ends mostly weighting them down and get buried. So I was able to get out into Spirit Lake with a boat and with a sonar. And here's a sonar recorder. The sonar recorder is a device that reads the profile of the lake. There's the automobile batteries that, that uh, power the sonar recorder. We made a profile and did a survey of the bottom of the lake. Uh, you see this uh, paper record that's given off by the sonar recorder and we're looking out diagonally over the bottom of the lake and we can see uh, several feet of water, probably 50 feet of water or so, below the towfish and we're looking at the bottom of the lake and then we're looking out diagonally 50 yards or so over the bottom uh, and there's the, there's the first reflection from the bottom. But notice, I see a sonar reflector right there inclined and there's an inclined sonar shadow. There's a sonar reflector and a big sonar shadow behind it. And then I notice, look at this, immense sonar reflector right there and then a sonar shadow behind it. Even seems to have out flaring root mass. It looks like a log just buried there and replanted. So on the basis of the sonar records, I had to go diving in Spirit Lake. And I'm a, I'm a certified research diver and uh, so I go diving in the lake. And uh, that, was, uh, uh, that was difficult diving situations. Here you see the the steaming lava dome, there I am, there's my diving buddy, and we're getting ready to look at the bottom of that upright deposited log in the lake. Underneath the log mat, you can see the logs floating there. And upright floaters amongst the log mats, uh, standing upright as the floating, prone floating logs are there around us. On the bottom of the lake, we saw the upright embedded logs on the bottom of the lake. That verifies that the logs are falling out and getting buried in the bottom of the lake. The logs fall out with their root ends buried at different strata layer levels in the lake, having the appearance of being multiple forests. And there I am, there's my diving buddy. Notice no, no bark on the trees. Yeah. So the bark has been peeled off and it's on the bottom of the lake in thick deposits. And uh, if the bottom of the lake was buried with all that tree bark sitting there, it would make a coal bed very much like the coal that we see in the geologic record.